All right, so Andreas asked me to make it brief and relaxed, so hence this is like, I don't know what this is, it's nice and brief and uh, hopefully relaxed as well. Make it a bit more relaxed, I'm going to tell it like a story, I'm going to have a fictional character, so I'm going to borrow this fictional character from Undea Voch, The Poor Mouth by Miles Nagopoulin, and I'm going to work with the character Bonaparte. Okunase. No, that's a little bit too hard. So how about Jams O'Donnell? Both being anyone who's read the poor mouth knows that Bonaparte Okunase became Jams O'Donnell, as did everybody else in his class. So we have this character, Jams O'Donnell, and we work with him as a way of kind of teasing through some of the issues. This paper was mm, prompted by an article that was published in the ESR last year. The article was about the advantage that Irish speakers have in the labour market. So this paper isn't a direct response to that, but it's rather a response to, I suppose, the implicit ontology in that paper and in things written by people like Mac Williams, in newspaper articles. There often seems to be the same implicit ontology. And this is that there are Irish speakers who live in Irish-speaking families, who are part of an Irish-speaking community. The kids from Irish-speaking families go on to a Grail school, an all-Irish school, primary school, then another Grail school for a secondary school, get all the advantages of a Grail school, go on to third level, normally university, get a degree, normally in, in education, and from there, go on to get a good job, normally in the public sector, and thanks to Paul, because of being part of a social network of Irish speakers. But this ontology, for want of a better word, seems to be implicit in a lot of piece, pieces, including this article that was in the ESR. So what I'm going to do is look at that and show that the, that's not really the normal life cycle of an Irish speaker. So to begin with, I'm going to say that Irish speakers are not actually Irish speakers anywhere to begin with. Um, a lot of articles that have been written have used the data from the census. And anyone who's looked at the census has seen that 42% of the population claim to be Irish speakers. Now, that sounds a bit, a bit much, really. We're talking there that close to 2 million people are Irish speakers. Doesn't really make sense. So then, if you look at other surveys, uh, the Committee on Irish Language Attitude Research, 1973, which was continued on by the Linguistics Institute in 1983, 1993, and then if you look at the uh, International Social Survey Program on National Identity in 2003, they give a figure of around about 10 to 15 percent who can speak Irish well. So really only a quarter of the people who claim to be Irish speakers in the census would actually claim to speak Irish well when it comes to these, these other censuses, uh, these other surveys, I should say. So I'm going to work more with that figure of 10 to 15 percent of being Irish speakers. Now, within that, you wouldn't say that that 10 to 15 percent are native speakers. Normally with the surveys, Around about 2% are native or near-native Irish speakers. The other 10% or more can engage in most conversations. So they speak Irish well. They claim to speak Irish well. So but what about the other two-thirds, then, of, of the census? Well, around about 20 to 25% of people in Ireland can understand some conversations can engage in conversations on, on some topics. And then the rest, of 42%, would be a mixture between parents saying that the kids are Irish speakers just because they're learning Irish at school, or they feel so strongly in favor of the language that even though they only have a, a few words, they say that they are Irish speakers. So there are a few there who, you know, would find, this, find it very difficult to engage in conversations in Irish, but yet in the sense that they're as Irish speakers. So I would say that those census Irish speakers, most of them are Irish speakers as such. Then 
if we have a look at how many of them actually speak Irish on a daily basis. This is a, another question from the census, which I think we can take as being a little bit more accurate. It asks specifically, how often do you speak Irish? About 2% of the population of Ireland claim to speak Irish on a daily basis, and then another 2% on a weekly basis. So even if you take, say, 10 to 15% as being able to speak Irish well, most of those people don't even speak Irish on a weekly basis. So they can, but they don't have the opportunity. All right, so let's go back to our dear friend, James O'Donnell. Let's take, say, for example, that he is not from the Gaelic, as James O'Donnell, the original character in the novel, was from the Gaelic. Let's say he's, he's from, from Dublin, so middle-class Dublin person growing up in an Irish-speaking family. Well, for that to have happened, there needs to be a parent who speaks Irish, or maybe two parents. So what's the chance of that happening? What's the chance of, say, for example, two Irish speakers meeting and having kids? What's the chance that they won't? They'll have one Irish speaker and one non-Irish speaker. And what's the chance then that they'll raise the children speaking Irish? So in each of those stages, the likelihood that the kids are going to be raised speaking Irish diminishes. So for argument's sake, let's say that, that James O'Donnell has two Irish-speaking parents in Dublin and gets to go to a Gaelic school. So James looks around the classroom and sees that most of the other kids in the class are not from Irish-speaking families. There aren't any precise figures at the moment, hopefully within the next couple of years there will be, but we can go back to the late 70s where O'Regan and O'Gleason found that about two-thirds of the kids in the class were coming from families that spoke no Irish at all. And I think the situation is, um, let's use the word worse, it's worse than it was then. I don't, sorry, I don't mean to pass judgment in that way. Um, I've got some anecdotal evidence of classes where you have one, possibly two kids in the whole class who come from Irish speaking families, the rest don't. Uh, parents outside the school, vast majority of them can't speak Irish. So that undermines that argument about that kind of implicit ontology that you have Irish-speaking families sending their kids to the Gaelic school because most of the kids in the Gaelic school don't come from Irish-speaking families to begin with. Then if you also look at what I've already said, 2% of the population speak Irish on a daily basis. Well, if 16% or 10 to, 10 to, say 10 to 15% of the population speak Irish well, but only 2% of the population speak Irish on a daily basis, that means that most of the people who, sp who can speak Irish well are not in Irish-speaking families. If they were, they'd speak Irish on a daily basis. And you'd expect then that if they're in an Irish-speaking community, that they would speak Irish at least once a week, and yet only 2% speak Irish on a weekly basis. So you can say that the Irish speakers are not part of Irish-speaking families, they're not part of Irish-speaking communities by and large. All right, so Jams went on to, to primary school. Now, I want to draw a distinction here. I've already mentioned that he's from Dublin rather than from the Gaeltop. There is a difference, of course. We have the Gaeltop communities. There are areas where people speak Irish to one another. But again, it's not a community as such. It's a scattering of little communities all along the West Coast. And even if you add them all together, all the Irish speakers in all the Gaeltop communities add up to 1.5% of the population of Ireland. So it's still small and it's, it's still scattered. Okay, so Jams finished his grade school, primary school, he wants to go on to secondary school. Let's assume that he was lucky enough to go on to secondary school. And the reason I say that, that he was lucky enough, is because only about a quarter of the numbers of pupils are in second level grade school now, as are in primary. Last year there was, was 31,000 pupils in primary grade school now, and over 8,000 in secondary, a second level grade school now. So only about a quarter of the kids can then go on to second level. So just say Jams is lucky enough to go on to second level. Most of the other kids he knew in primary school have gone. They've gone on to English language secondary schools. 
now he's in, in secondary school. He's got all these advantages that people like McWilliams and various newspaper articles have mentioned. Is the advantages of a grade school. Well, what are these? The advantage of being bilingual. Yeah, that's a great advantage, but not specifically about the Irish language. I mean, anyone who's bilingual has that advantage. There are lots of advantages, and lots and lots of papers written about advantages. Uh, picking up another language. Um, there's been research that uh, the kids in the grade school can actually read English better than their counterparts in an English language school. Um, that they have a better mathematical ability. But these are not abilities that are specific to uh, Irish speakers. There are abilities, cognitive abilities, that bilingual, multilingual proficiency uh, brings. Other advantages, bonus points in the leaving search, and most people get the specifics of that wrong. Um, I can mention it at the end if you want, or you can look up the Examination Commission's website to get the specifics of that. I've never seen it written correctly anywhere except, obviously, on the Education Commission's website. Um, small classes. Yeah, I was curious about that, so I picked one area, an area near here, and looked at all the Grail School and the primary schools in that area. There were six. One of them was uh, a Grail School. The other five were English language primary schools. The Grail School had the worst pupil-teacher ratio in comparison to the five English language schools. So that kind of puzzled me if they have an the advantage. I thought, well, maybe it's because Grail School are often small. And there's a presumption, therefore, that the small class size is put. And that one evidence, that one example, wasn't the case. Perhaps there were worse uh, facilities for being a small school. I don't know. It would require a little bit more research to find out what the case is across the country. The biggest advantage, and I'm going to quote here, it's the, that Grail Skullner are a bastion of middle class advantage. Yes, maybe they are. The point there is that it's not about the Irish language, it's about middle class. It's about middle class advantage. And I think the best way to look at that is to compare the Irish language schools outside the Belfast with the ones in the Belfast and see, well, if it's an advantage that has to do with having an education through Irish, well, then surely it would be the same case in the Belfast. So one of the examples that was uh, raised was that more Grail Skullina send all their pupils to third level than, than the average school in the country. And that seems to be the case, all right. But if you look at the Grail Talk schools, fewer of them send all the kids on to third level. So they seem to be disadvantaged. So you could say that the Grail Skullina are advantaged and the Grail Talk schools are disadvantaged, which suggests that it's not the Irish language as such. And yeah, perhaps it's that the Grail School and are a bastion of middle class advantage. And that's, I think, the question that needs to be investigated. That's one, I think, requires um, concepts like cultural capital to try and investigate exactly what's going on there. The next thing, Jams goes to second level and has all these advantages, including the advantages to do a bonus point. Um, well, leaving aside the fact that he probably had to read his leadership textbooks in English and then answer the questions in Irish, but that's another matter. Uh, then went on to, to university. Got, got good points in leadership and went on to university. After university, then got a good job. Now, this is where we come to the, the point of the ESR article, that the that Irish speakers gain an advantage in the labor market. And the part of that has to do with being part of a social network of Irish speakers. Again, I mean, this is something that needs to be investigated. I mean, how, how does that happen? And I could imagine that happening for Irish speakers as well as for English speakers. I can imagine it being part of that overall middle class advantage. I can't see a social network of 15% of the population. I can't imagine that so Jams O'Donnell goes in for an interview and there's another Irish speaker there who gives Jam makes sure Jams O'Donnell gets a job because he's an Irish speaker. That doesn't really make sense. I mean, it could be investigated, but it doesn't make sense to me. But if Jams O'Donnell goes in to interview and someone on the interview panel happened to have gone to the same second level school, then yeah, maybe. I can imagine that happening. But 
same thing could happen regardless of what school, whether it was a grade school or not a grade school. So there are those networks that come about from second level schools. And you see them with um, grade school, and of course, that people remain friends after school and speak Irish to one another. It's a nice to have a little network of friends in that way. But you would think that going on to good jobs that require a degree, you'd be better off with a network of friends who are graduates, who went to the university with you. And there isn't an all-Irish university as such. There's Ocad of Nguyenga in, uh, in Panamar. And there are various courses taught completely through Irish. But there's not a university as such. So the, the chances that there'll be a social network of Irish speakers who are graduates uh, is, is, is limited. So there's, there's something there maybe worth investigating, but there doesn't seem to be, well, to my mind, I don't think there's any difference between Irish speakers and uh, non-Irish speakers in that situation. What to me seems to be the case is that when someone gets a good job, I think we're talking about the public sector jobs, that good job would have required a good education. A good education means that you know, the people did well at school all the way through, got good points and went back to university. Part of that education included learning Irish at school. So those who have done well at school, you would expect to also have done well in Irish, along with all the other subjects. So the people who get these good jobs as a result of having a good education, you'd expect there to be a higher percentage of people with at least a minimal prof minimum proficiency in Irish. And if you're working with the 42% uh, census, Irish speakers. Well, you'd expect, yeah, that a lot of those people would uh, have been people who would have been educated in English language schools and uh, achieved that minimum standard, minimum proficiency in Irish. So, what I think we have here is that because very few people are in um, Irish-speaking families, as I said, two percent of the population speak Irish on a daily basis, and that would include both people who are in Irish-speaking families and people who just meet other Irish speakers on a daily basis. So the number of Irish-speaking families is, is not huge in terms, of, you know, in terms of the population of the country, in terms of the, the percentage of Irish speakers generally. So the Irish language hasn't really been transmitted from generation to generation solely through the family. But to a large extent, it's being supported. Perhaps the main way it's being transmitted is through the education system. If we go back to 1988, Oregon had an article in the International Journal of Sociology Language, and in that he said that it was thanks to the education system that this committed percentage of Irish speakers continued to exist from generation to generation. But again, think about the Gales Dolan. They only account for uh, 5%, what was it, 4.7%, I think, of all the pupils are in Gales Dolan at the moment. If you look at the second level, it's only 2.2%. So it's not the Gales Dolan, and it's not the Irish speaking families, it's to a large extent, it's the English language schools that are teaching people Irish for 14 years, the kids who do well at school. A high enough percentage, well, a small percentage, but a high percentage in terms of the overall number of Irish speakers. Um, they managed to keep enough Irish going to be able to claim to be Irish speakers at the end of the day. So the inter intergenerational transmission of the language is largely supported by the education system, particularly by uh, the education system in English language schools. So the advantages that are gained in Gaelskolana you can't say that they're specifically gained by Irish speakers as a small percentage of the people going through there are Irish speakers from the cradle. So what we find is that the education system is creating um, Irish speakers. So then um, if we look, let's just get on to the last piece, cultural capital. I think this is just an initial foray into the idea of using cultural capital to try and explain some of the yeah, the things that are happening here. Cultural capital, okay, we're talking about just put simply social quality, social skills that are passed on through socialization. They're embodied. They help to endorse advantage 
So those who have an advantage can pass on that culture capital to the socialization process at home, in schools, on to the next generation. So those with an advantage can keep on that advantage. So the argument I make here is that education, of course, is an important resource. And those who have the culture capital can exploit the resources of the education system. And one of the core subjects in the education system is Irish. So that it's one of the resources that people acquire and one of the resources that can be exploited by those who already have an advantage. So it's rather than Irish speakers as such having an advantage, it's those who have an advantage become Irish speakers. They're the ones who acquire the advantages of the education system, including the Irish language. Some of those advantages are gone. If you go back to 1974, <coughs> the requirement um, to have Irish for recruitment to the civil service was abolished. The year before that, 1973, the requirement to pass Irish in the leaving service was abolished. So those kind of very specific advantages, the ways in which cultural capital can be converted into um, sort of material capital, which later on, of course, can then be converted into economic capital in terms of getting a job. So that was changed a little bit at that stage. But what's interesting is that since that period, the percentage of people claiming to speak Irish has increased dramatically. I mean, we're talking about 42% now. That's been steady since 1996. But if you go back to 19, the 1970s, it was, I think it was about 22%. So it gradually went from there in the early 70s, from about 22%, all the way up to 42%, from the 70s to, to the 90s. So while that ability to convert the symbolic culture capital into kind of a more material culture capital was uh, kind of worn away by those uh, changes, yet the Irish language's symbolic capital seems to have remained all the way through that period. It's a strengthened in terms of the numbers of people claiming to be to be Irish speakers. I'm just going to finish off on something I think is kind of amusing. This idea of linguistic culture capital. I was toying with this, trying to imagine what can linguistic culture capital really mean? Can we talk about an Irish speaking elite? I was thinking, well, the lingua franca here is, is English. I mean, whether, you know, the elite in Ireland are not Irish speakers. They speak English to one another. And linguistic culture capital is not really so much about kind of gaining another language. It's again about embodiment. So it's how the language is embodied within you. So this is just kind of tongue in cheek that if you can imagine that the Irish language is um, embodied, but since the language you speak from day to day is English, so then the Irish language is embodied in Irish speakers, and it gives them uh, in, in 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 the elite, and it gives them an advantage. Well, how could we imagine that the Irish language to be embodied in them, other than in in their accent? And the way that they be recognised as having that advantage when they speak English is in speaking English with a brogue. And then we can think back to to Swift. Now, what Swift says in the 18th century that yeah, maybe it's a good idea for gentlemen in the country to learn Irish. But if they do that, they better not go near England. Because if they do, people will immediately hear the bro, and all they'll expect to hear is bulls and blunders. And I don't think that's changed. I think if someone speaks Irish with that bro, or speaks English with that bro, it still has that kind of effect. So the Irish language, even in terms of being uh, embodied within one and then expressed to the way one speaks English, I think is unlikely to have an advantage. So that's, that's just kind of tongue-in-cheek at the end, but how to imagine how linguistic cultural capital could be, uh, could be embodied. So basically what I'm saying here is that it's not so much that Irish speakers have an advantage. It's that the education system creates the people who are called Irish speakers. They're not Irish speakers by and large from the cradle. They become Irish speakers thanks to the education system. And the ones who most exploit those resources are the ones who already have an advantage. So rather than Irish speakers having an advantage, it's people who have an advantage become Irish speakers. That's it.